is about the story of Donald Trump and E. Jean Carroll and the story of Donald Trump and Taylor Swift, because ultimately they are the same story. There is every chance that you have never considered E. Jean Carroll and Taylor Swift in the same sentence, but they are at the core of what Trump is and the cancer he has tapped into and then spread among people in this country. Because Trump's treatment of E. Jean Carroll and Trump's treatment of Hillary Clinton and Trump's treatment of Stormy Daniels and Trump's treatment of Nikki Haley and Trump's treatment of Nancy Pelosi and Megyn Kelly and Katie Turr and a thousand other women, they are all the same thing. He treats them as if they were not quite human. Which is how he and his flying monkeys are about to treat Taylor Swift. It's Swift Boating, the 2024 version. Rolling Stone now reports that a source close to Trump, and their sources have been pretty much on the money, says his proxies have declared, quote, holy war against Swift. They seem to dance around how much, if any, of this will be done by Trump himself, but, quoting, Trump has also privately claimed that he is, quote, more popular, unquote, than Swift is, and that he has more committed fans than she does, and that as late as December, Trump was whining that it, quote, obviously made no sense that he was not chosen Time Magazine's Person of the Year for 2023. A, Time Magazine's Person of the Year for 2023 was Taylor Swift. B, wait, there's still a Time Magazine? It no longer takes very much to get the Trump cult to start believing that the voices in their heads are not aneurysms in waiting, but rather divine communications. And as we saw Sunday and Monday and continuing into yesterday, the Taylor Swift conspiracy theories are piling up too fast for them to be properly catalogued. She was sent to destroy the Kansas City Chiefs team by ruining their star tight end, Travis Kelsey. No! The entire football season was rigged to make a superstar out of Travis Kelsey and his Bud Light commercials and his vaccination commercials and dating Taylor Swift as a psyop so they could both go to the Super Bowl where they would appear at halftime and endorse Joe Biden. And sure, players in the Super Bowl don't appear at halftime, but that's all part of the plot. What plot? The election interference plot. Because if anybody endorses Biden, that's election interference. In fact, if anybody votes for Biden, that's election interference. And how do we know that's the real Taylor Swift? All this would be as stupid as everything else loser Jay Trump does. It is clear that for his stupid people, the stupider it is, the better. Except that Trump's stalking horse in the GOP presidential campaign, Vivek Ramaswamy, hugged the third rail of Swiftian conspiracy. At 6.47 p.m. Eastern last night, one of his online parrots, Jack Posobiec, posted right on cue, quote, Trump is more popular and has a larger base than Taylor Swift. Well, he's got a larger something that might be called a base. This affirms Posobiec is so stupid that his stupidity has to be continued on to whoever is standing next to him. Trump's nitwit lawyer, Alina, I can fake being smart, Haba, reposted on Monday, quote, who thinks this country needs a lot more women like Alina Haba and a lot less like Taylor Swift? Apparently she lost that straw vote, 11 billion to three. Janine Pirro has already muttered something about Swift on Fox. I couldn't quite make out what it was, whether she was making a comment or ordering drinks. Greg Kelly, fired from Fox, now of Newsmax, who is actually just a sack of potatoes wearing a tie, said idolatry of Taylor Swift was a sin, and it says so in the Bible, and he segued seamlessly from that into idolatry of Trump. And readmitted from purgatory, moon-faced Trump henchman Jason Miller responded to that Rolling Stone story by actually writing to them, quote, Joe Biden might be counting on Taylor Swift to save him, but voters are looking at these sky-high inflation rates and saying, we are never, ever getting back together. And I think I would pay somebody in the Biden camp a million dollars to say maybe they should just do what former Trump staffer A.J. Delgado would say that Jason Miller would do in that situation, slip something into the voters' drinks. 
Rolling Stone reports that this is just the start of this. Quote, as Trump has been having a popularity contest with Swift in his own head, others close to him, including GOP operatives, some of his 2024 staff and Trumpy media figures have been brainstorming different ways to go after Swift. Since late last year, these Trump allies have repeatedly discussed how to turn the culture warrior dial up to 11. Quote, it would be more fuel thrown onto the culture war fires, unquote, says an official working on the Trump reelection efforts. Quote, another left leaning celebrity who is part of the Democrat elite telling you what to think. The salient point, of course, is that the Republicans are already losing the culture war. Anybody remember Ron DeSantis and the idea that there is some baseline that invalidates having celebrities taking political stances neglects the fact that Trump has his own A-list. Well, B-list. D-minus. Okay, he has a list of people who used to be on a list. Kid Rock! John Voight! Still alive? John Voight! Scott Baio! Ted Nugent. Is he still not in jail? Ted Nugent, the Baldwin brother who nobody knows what his first name is. That former fighter, Tyrone, Tycho, Ty, Ty Dye. We don't have a Taylor Swift on our side, but you know who we have? We have Kid Rock. We have Ted Nugent. We have influencers. Right? We have all these people. John Voight. John Voight. He's still alive? John Voight. If at this exact moment... While you are listening to this, Trump was presented undeniable evidence that Taylor Swift were about to endorse him and not Biden. The entirety of the far right would pivot on a dime within three hours, and not only would celebrity endorsements be okay and valid and thoughtful, but the fascists would deem them to be more valuable than the endorsement of unions or governors or a majority of Trump's former press secretaries. The problem, though, in that fantasy world is that Trump who is crazy, would still hate Taylor Swift, would still burn with rage that Taylor Swift won an award only he still remembers, would still burn with rage that any woman got anything that he wanted. There is a cynical, but to some degree, valid perception that Trump won in 2016 and lost in 2020, in part because his hatred of Biden often seemed forced, seemed manufactured, had to be cobbled together with labyrinthine, impenetrable conspiracies involving Ukraine and Rudy Giuliani not wearing pants and a laptop and that really scary-looking guy with the Tama Shanter on his head and his eyes on opposite sides of his head, the guy who had the laptop? In 2016, Trump hated Hillary Clinton, and he did not need to open his mouth to convey it. A woman stood in the way of something he wanted and believed he deserved. It is notable that for all the stochastic threats Trump has made against dozens and dozens of men and women since 2015, still the most vivid, the most explicit, were against Hillary Clinton, the ones in which he said if she supported gun control, she should dismiss her Secret Service protection and then see what happened. It was a direct demand of his cultists to try to assassinate her. And the key element... The evil authenticity about a man who can also fake evil with the best of them was that Hillary Clinton was a woman and women to Donald Trump are there for one thing. And when they're done, he has a nice reward for them in a lovely location near the first tee at the golf course in New Jersey. Consider. The alleged victim was, quote, deep in conversation with acquaintances at a crowded Manhattan night spot and did not notice the figure to her right on a red velvet couch until she recalls his fingers slid under her miniskirt, moved up her inner thigh and touched her vagina through her underwear. Yep, the Harvey Weinstein nightmare is seemingly unending and its evil even touches politics tangentially. 
But, of course, the man on the red velvet couch was not Harvey Weinstein, but according to the former model Kristen Anderson, it was Donald Trump. I'll go backstage before a show before and everyone's getting dressed and ready and everything else. And, you know, no men are anywhere and I'm allowed to go in because I'm the owner and therefore I'm inspecting it. They're standing there with no clothes. Is everybody okay? And you see these incredible looking women. And so I sort of get away with things like that. The Harvey Weinstein crisis and the Me Too movement that rolled out alongside it has been a true and unceasing epidemic. But of course, that entertainment mogul describing how he got away with staring at the naked women backstage was not Harvey Weinstein, but was, by his own admission, Donald Trump. After another alleged victim revealed that she was pushed against the wall and the perpetrator had forced his tongue into her mouth, the alleged perpetrator later told his apologists, quote, take a look, you take a look, look at her, you tell me what you think. The man who has dismissed accuser after accuser, including the one just awarded $83 million after he defamed her, too. The man who has dismissed accuser after accuser by implying she wasn't good enough looking for him to have attacked her was not Harvey Weinstein. It was, according to the victims, Donald Trump. After the other victim, one of the other victims... One of at least two dozen self-revealed victims said he lifted up the airplane armrest that separated them and grabbed her breasts and tried to put his hand up her skirt. The perpetrator told a different group of his apologists, quote, believe me, she would not be my first choice. But the Republicans press forward to make the issue of rape or sexual misconduct into some sort of symbol of the Democrats. And Kellyanne Conway can still speak with a straight face about Trump empowering women when she was his campaign manager. When the pussy grabber tape came out and Trump pretended it was locker room talk instead of merely the soundtrack to his decades of lechery. And when Sebastian Gorka can still tell his idiot viewers, quote, the left in the media love their scumbags. It's really that simple. Let us call a scumbag a scumbag and recognize that the Republicans elected their scumbag president and to this day continue to support their scumbag and now expect the rest of us to listen as their scumbag and his junior scumbags prepare to try to destroy Taylor Swift because like all the women Trump assaulted, she just would not do what he wants her to do. A couple of follow-up headlines. The Illinois State Election Board says it does not have the authority to determine whether insurrectionist Trump violated the 14th Amendment, and thus it rules it can't remove him from the ballot there. Of course, it doesn't need to have the authority. It should be questioning whether or not it has the authority to put disorder J. Trump on the ballot after he engaged in insurrection while an officer of the United States as defined by the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia and by the way the 14th Amendment is self-executing as defined by Jefferson Davis in 1868 this podcast I will repeat has a good reach it is not however ubiquitous somebody else is going to have to inform these attorneys and courts that they are now acting against the will of the sainted Scalia, and he will no doubt reappear from beyond the grave, the size of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man from Ghostbusters, and come over and crush their neighborhoods. By the way, I am informed the Supreme Court could also get the 14th Amendment entirely wrong and invalidate our constitutional form of government and let Trump run for president, even though he is ineligible, as early as a week from today. Consider this bit of political science fiction. What happens if he runs for president, though ineligible to serve, and is elected, and then we find out, through some agency that he is ineligible to be sworn in. All right, back to this timeline. The other campaign news, the New York Times reports that the biggest pro-Biden super PAC is now booking time and space, hockey term, on TV and digital and streaming in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin for Biden ads to run in those states between August 23rd and November 5th. That's the day after the Democratic convention ends through election day how many ads 
um, a few, a few hundred and forty million dollars worth. Well, that that's that's just the TV spend, one hundred and forty million. The digital spend is another one hundred and ten million. So they've already bought a quarter of a billion dollars in advertising for two months and two weeks in just the seven swing states. Now, I'm wondering if they could get fired Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich or soon-to-be-fired Speaker of the House Mike Johnson to serve as Biden campaign spokesman. Gingrich went on Fox and revealed that there is no issue the fascists actually care about except re-election and power. Don't make a deal on the border, he says, quote, it's just dumb. It's like having an absolute winning hand and saying, please, can I just lay these down and lose the game? Terrified people fleeing to our borders because not to means deprivation and death. And they are drowning in the Rio Grande because Greg Abbott won't let federal agents rescue them. And Gingrich thinks it's a game. Newt, you do know if any of the major religions are correct, you are going to hell. And this is Speaker Johnson at his news conference being asked by Manu Raju of CNN if he's talked to Trump about the border security compromise, and Johnson manages to say, no, of course not. That's absurd. He has not spoken to Trump about border security. On the other hand, he has spoken to Trump about border security. Judging by his comments, he clearly wants to campaign on this issue. Have you spoken to him about the Senate proposal, and are you simply trying to kill this to help him on the campaign? No, Manu, that's absurd. We have a responsibility here to do our duty. Our duty is to do right by the American people, to protect the people. The first and most important job of the federal government is to protect its citizens. I have talked to, to former President Trump about this issue at length, and um, and he understands that. He understands that we have a responsibility to do here. Pick Speaker Johnson up by his shoulders, please, and check the soles of his shoes, because I'm guessing that's where they have inscribed his speakership expiration date. This guy is dumber than the last five. Lastly, to steal from my old frenemy Craig Kilborn, here is your daily moment of zen, Nikki Haley again. Eight days in a row. When she does it today, it'll be the ninth. Nikki Haley again saying Trump is crazy on national television. He didn't just get me confused. He mentioned it over and over and over again. Mm, yeah. He's not what he was in 2016. He has declined. Mm. That's a fact. Am I wrong to think that if I ever take an actual vacation day from this podcast before the election, that I should ask Nikki Haley to fill in for me? Keith Olbermann is hospitalized today, recovering from stab wounds. Nikki Haley, blah, blah, blah. also of interest here, I will resume the theme of misogyny morphing into murderous contempt for all women and cite an example I witnessed firsthand, courtesy my then employers at MSNBC. And then at the opposite end of the same spectrum, more scandal from that book banning group Moms for Liberty. I wonder if this one leader of the group Moms for Liberty said, I'm a mom for liberty, while she was sitting on the lap of the underage boy she had already loaded up with liquor, telling him he was her favorite. Ah, it's moms for that kind of liberty. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Oberman. Postscripts to the news, some headlines, some updates, some snark, some predictions. Dateline Buckingham, Pennsylvania, over at Miss Clarice's house. <laughs> Miss Clarice, according to the Bucks County Times newspaper, was known to all the high school kids in her town. One underaged witness said underage drinking was an age-old ritual there. Miss Clarice would even pour it for you. Another witness said they took 15 shots of liquor and then partnered with Miss Clarice, aged 36, in a game of beer pong. 
One witness said that after Miss Clarice sat on his lap and she told him he was her, quote, favorite, he pretended to have to use the bathroom. One, identified as C.E., said they all saw the drinking and the second party that was going on upstairs with Miss Clarice's mom, and he and his group made for the door and left. That's when they discovered they had left one of the group behind in Miss Clarice's house. They went back to get them, and to quote the newspaper, C.E. testified Schillinger answered the door and eventually said to him, the only thing I asked is that nobody leave the house. Schillinger then allegedly grabbed him by his shirt and hit him multiple times with a closed fist around his chin and cheek. Miss Clarice, of course... Schillinger, as she's referred to in the story, is Clarice Schillinger, former aspirant for the Republican nomination for lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania, head of her own local group to elect like-minded people to the local school boards. Bring your beer pong. And, of course, local distributor of whatever it is they're drinking inside Moms for Liberty, a.k.a. Moms for Nazi Liberty, a.k.a. after the story of Mr. and Mrs. Ziegler and their girlfriend in Florida, Moms for that kind of liberty, waka, waka, waka. And this was all at the hearing in court on the charges against Miss Clarice, And they were not dismissed, and she will stand trial, even though her attorney offered the impeccable, inarguable argument that the boy she punched was way bigger than her, and he wasn't hurt, so what's the big deal? And then that attorney emailed this priceless statement to the media, quote, Ms. Schillinger has dedicated her life to public service. Yeah, that's what she was doing, sitting on the underage boy's lap. Service. Public service. Thank you, Nancy Faust. Still ahead on Countdown, yes, Abby Phillip of CNN said something condescending about me from inside her bubble where she does not know her daily demo audience for a show CNN wastes millions of dollars on is 25 to 30 percent smaller than the daily audience of this podcast I do for you in my apartment, in my spare time, by myself, unless you count the dogs. And yes, Megyn Kelly, who owns all the camera filters that Carrie Lake does not own, again said something nasty about me, and I I didn't even bother to look past the headline because Megyn Kelly has some sort of Miss Clarice thing for me, and knowledge of that is punishment enough for any man. But there is a theme to this edition of the podcast, and it's sexism and misogyny by the very people Megyn Kelly is owned by, and the very people Abby Phillip apologizes for. And while those people mostly are Republicans and conservatives and other fascists, it's not 100%. Having addressed the conservative and conservative adjacent misogynists or misogynist sympathizers like Philip and Kelly and and Trump, I do want to mention a few of the left-wing misogynists, like the NBC executives who 16 years ago today were still telling me, sometimes literally, why would we hire Rachel Maddow? No viewer is going to watch a woman do the political news. Things I promise not to tell. And who said them? Coming up. First time for the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons of the world. Or worst persons in the world. I've only been doing this bit since 2005. Why would I remember the name of it? Worst persons! Dans le monde. 
We'll skip Kelly and Phillip. LeBron's worse. The New York Times, which has hired Andrew Marchand away from the New York Post to become senior writer in sports business and media for the website The Athletic. Huge mistake. He is not an honest broker. Marchand covered sports in New York. Then he went to work for ESPN in New York. Then he went back to the New York Post to cover TV sports. I knew him for about 15 years. We never had a problem. Always friendly, professional, very supportive of my work. And then in 2018, Marchand contacted me looking for an off-the-record confirmation of a leak that said that my bosses at ESPN had warned me not to comment in public or on social media after a string of racist tweets by Roseanne Barr got her fired by our parent company, Disney. I told Marchand on the record that nobody at ESPN or anywhere else had warned me or contacted me or even mentioned it to me, and I did that because they hadn't. Marchand then published the following, quote, ESPN managers are telling their most outspoken broadcasters and writers to be careful on social media in light of Disney axing Roseanne Barr's TV show over her racist tweets, sources told The Post. A source said that the Disney-owned ESPN was specifically reaching out to the most politically outspoken of its broadcasters. Jamel Hill, Keith Olbermann, and Kenny Mayne are the ones most frequently associated with venturing outside of sports, unquote. It wasn't true about me when he asked. It wasn't true about me when he wrote it. On the other hand, if Marshan's source lied to him about a warning by ESPN to me and he believed the lie and the lying source, Marshan should have written it. But it was his minimal journalistic obligation to then also include my denial, especially since my denial was on the record, as opposed to an anonymous source charging that this had happened. And this is not just a clerical concern. Those paragraphs leading his column fed into a false narrative that ESPN was watching me like a hawk to make sure I did not mix sports and reality. In point of fact, I had gone back to ESPN that year, so I did not have to report on reality. Thank you very much. I called Marchand. I called him out on this. I asked him to add my denial to a future column. That's all I asked. No apology, no correction. No, it's not true. Just put me on the record saying they didn't call me. He refused. And in the six years since, he has used his column to denigrate my work and me. He is not an honest broker. And if the New York Times and The Athletic don't believe that's true, soon enough, they'll find out. Worser, the runner-up, Mawia Bartawomo, who used to be a business journalist, but now spends an hour or two on Fox every day, drifting further and further off into the outer space of her own mind. Interviewing Congressman Fluger of Texas, Wait, there's a Congressman Fluger? Interviewing Congressman Fluger about the three American service members killed in Jordan, she said, well, maybe they're focused too much on DEI. And then she went off on a rant about DEI, which is diversity, etc., in the FBI. And the Congressman looked alarmed, since the lost service members were in the, uh, you know, Army and not in the FBI. And you could almost read Congressman Fluger's thoughts, which would have been something like, D-E-I, Maria, shouldn't you be more worried about D-U-I? But our winner, the worst, Elon Musk and Sean McBrarty. McBrarty is an unemployed man who bills himself on Twitter as an education advocate. Like Miss Clarice considers herself an education advocate. Oh, you're learning. As one wag put it, his new job is reading sex scenes from books out loud at school board meetings in Maine and calling everybody groomer. Recently, McBrarty expanded the range of his hapless existence to doxing Shenna Bellows, the Maine Secretary of State who was required by law to rule on Trump's eligibility for the ballot under the 14th Amendment. And as we now know, the late Supreme Court Justice Scalia already ruled on that. Trump is ineligible because he engaged in insurrection and his office was president, which was an officer of the United States. Anyway, McBrarity posted her email and address on Twitter, and sure enough, she then got swatted and the death threats. Now, I'm not going to dox McBrarity, but I will point out he lives in Maine. He appears to be cross-eyed. He shows up at school board meetings and reads porn out loud. And under his very attractive crew cut, his head does seem to come to a point. Just in case you're trying to find him. 
Just as big an issue here is Musk, who 13 months ago suspended a bunch of us on Twitter for doxing. I guess doxing his kid, his ex-wife, him. We never found out because he never bothered to explain. He just repeated doxing, 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 doxing like a drugged up parrot or minor bird. But what this scumbag McBrady did was doxing. Legal definition of doxing. And Musk has done nothing. Doxing on Musk's platform. Musk is an accessory to doxing. This woman, Shanna Bellows, Secretary of State for Maine. Sean McBrady of Maine, Elon Musk of... Well, he's too high to notice even if you did try to confront him. Today's worst persons in of or darn the world to the number one story on the countdown and my favorite topic me and things i promised not to tell to his credit phil griffin later recanted this and apologized for it at least to me But during the fourth or fifth month out of the 12 that I tried to talk him and MSNBC into giving one of our regular countdown guests a shot at guest hosting the show, he said this, and he said it as near as I can calculate, on or about October 5th, 2007. So the theory is, he said, straight guys are not going to watch a lesbian anchoring the news or doing a political commentary show or whatever. Now, he showed, to borrow a current phrase from the Trump documents case, a little consciousness of guilt. I have nothing against them. God, no. I'm not prejudiced. I went to Vassar. He actually said that. I think she's great on the show, but, you know, maybe men just won't be, you know... I pretended to not know, so he'd have to say it. They won't be attracted to Rachel Maddow. Honest to God, even as he spoke, I had a sense of the great opportunity flying out Phil Griffin's NBC window. Or maybe more accurately, I had a sense of the opportunity to build a base of authentic, fact-driven, genuine, liberal news commentary on corporate television being pushed out that window to plummet to its death in that surprisingly chintzy skating rink next to 30 Rock. I told Phil that I hoped he realized what he was saying, whether he and thus NBC thought they were not prejudiced. They were, in fact, prejudicing at right that very minute. And there were many of them prejudicing. But I also needed to be pragmatic. I told him that he was also wildly wrong about his assumption of who was attractive to whom. And the way to find that out was to go to the popular liberal website, The Daily Coast. I told him every night they live blog countdown, and when Rachel is on, there are three kinds of comments. Most are about what she's talked about and how smart she is and how right she is. The next biggest group of comments is asking why she doesn't have her own show. And then the last group is everybody who wants to go to bed with her. I'd say there are very few lesbians in this group, Phil, mostly straight men insisting they'd ask her out just in case she'd gotten her orientation wrong. And there's a lot of straight women in there saying they'd date her just in case they'd gotten their orientation wrong. And for God's sakes, there are comments from people claiming they're gay men and they say they love her so much they'd give it a shot. I confess this might be counterintuitive if you were a television executive and thus not as smart as the average person, but it was still all true. I hope to God this is not what you're basing your position on this on, I told him. But she is not physically attractive only to other lesbians she is in fact physically attractive to everybody phil cut me off it won't work buddy besides even if i believed you there are all the problems that steve kappas has with the idea last time i brought it up i thought kappas was going to start crying steve kappas was the president of nbc news how no one had any idea He had been Brian Williams' line producer upon the launch of MSNBC more than a decade earlier, and after Brian finished murdering Tom Brokaw's career and carving up the parts and smuggling them out under his toga, Kappas got the big chair. Griffin was not yet officially president of MSNBC, but would become so soon, and he ran the place, and Kappas was his boss. I did not literally pitch this new Maddow show idea every day to every one of the dozens of Thanksgiving Day Parade balloon-sized egos who ran MSNBC and NBC News, and they did not literally each have a different answer. It only seemed that way. Kappas, 
who would later be fired by his new Comcast boss after, she told me, he told her he would not work for some woman. Kappas had some gender-based misgivings too, but the objection that was uniquely his was that to air a second show similar to mine would, quote, brand MSNBC as a liberal network. He then contradicted himself. You have the only liberal newscast on cable. Why do you want to give up the monopoly? I really did not know where he was going with this. Okay, you're the only liberal news show on cable. No, on television. Why let anybody else onto your turf? What if she was more popular than you? What if she was easier to work with with than you? And, and we phased you out and phased her in. What if she took less money and we could be paying you less money or threatening you to have to take less money? What if she took less? What if she took money we could be paying you? I felt myself inhaling deeply. Uh, Steve, I, I don't do this so I can be some kind of liberal Rush Limbaugh. I... I I believe what I say on the air. I, I believe it's necessary to the, you know, survival of the country. I, I really don't think we can survive another Republican president after Bush, Steve. I want other liberal hosts. Hell, I want 23 other liberal hosts. And, you know, I have enough money. If you want to give me some more money, I'll take some more money. But I'd rather have another show on MSNBC following mine. And, you know, about the money, money is another reason I don't care about a monopoly. I know this will sound weird. I think you guys should be rewarded with more money for backing me up as this show has gotten, you know, less and less newsy and more and more commentary -y. That's what I think of when I think of the term, he's a team player. You should get some money. Steve Kappas moved behind his desk and began to shuffle papers. I could see the papers were blank. And Steve, I know how much money this would be worth to you. That got his attention. I said, you, you do know the salesmen wander into my office once a week, or they send bottles of champagne, or if they ask if they can send me hookers because they're finally selling ad time on the network. You know that, right? He nodded with annoyance. So they tell me that your profit off me last year was like $100 million. Now, I don't care if it's half that much or twice that much, but I know it's a lot, considering we were losing that much four years ago when we were in fourth place, how come you don't want to make more of that money? What if her show did as well as mine? Between the shows, that's $200 million a year, maybe. What if it only did half as well? That's $150 million a year. Why doesn't NBC want that money? What if it does twice as well as mine? Why do you insist on drawing the largest audience in this network's history for a cable news liberal show, and then as it ends at 8.59.59, you yell at them, everybody get the hell out. We don't want your liberal kind here. It's 9 o'clock. It's time for Dan Abrams and the missing white woman of the week show. Get out. Campus stood up, which was my signal to leave. I don't discuss network finance with talent. Ask Jeff Zucker. Oh, and even if I agreed with you, there are all the problems Jeff Zucker has with the show. Not a man of honor, Jeff Zucker was perpetually reneging on something he had written into my contract renegotiation from 2007. He summoned me one day to explain why he was reneging on the monthly essays I was supposed to do for NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. The easy explainer was Brian was threatened by them. In point of fact, Brian was threatened by everything, including rocks and trees. I did not fight over the tedious essays. And instead, I switched the subject to the 9 p.m. show on MSNBC, and Zucker resumed his best friend act. Look, you're doing great for us. You are us. There's no doubt about this. We stank. We lost money. Now we stink less, and we make money. Thank you. This is why we gave you more money. I got nothing against Rachel Maddow, but you got to drop this. We don't need another show. What maybe we need is supersizing your show. Run it, you know, till 9.15 or 9.30, or, or we just rerun the whole hour again at 9 and maybe again at 10. And of course... And here came the Jeff Zucker extraterrestrial lizard smile. We'd have to pay you more. It was tough ever to surprise Zucker, but he flinched when I asked him point blank about Phil Griffin's problems with the, you know, LGBTQ hosts. Oh, we all say a lot of things. But how could he have said that? He's in charge of MSNBC. Nobody in charge of MSNBC would ever say a thing like that. Now, what I remember him and I discussing is, outside of the ones Ailes has put on at 10 after Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity, name me one woman who has succeeded anchoring her own news show in primetime on cable. One woman. 
or on broadcast. Name me one on broadcast. Connie Chung? Katie Couric? Is Katie doing well at CBS without us? Don't you, didn't you tell Moonves she wouldn't play in primetime? You were right. Now think about that. And then think about how you'd supersize Countdown and how much you'd charge us for it. Okay, pal? If you ever had sudden memory loss and you couldn't tell Jeff Zucker from Phil Griffin, the rule of thumb was Zucker always called you pal and Griffin always called you buddy. The problem with this misogynistic, sexist, narrow-minded answer was that it was factually correct. And I'll wait a second. Of course, it was only correct in the same way that you could have looked to the White House and said there had been 43 presidents to that point, and they'd all been white guys, and that proved that minorities and women just couldn't win an election. No woman had succeeded as a solo news anchor in cable or broadcast in prime time. And I said to Zucker, maybe no woman has done that because the ones you've hired since I first came here have been like Debbie Norville and Ashley Banfield and Cynthia Oxney and Laura Ingram and Monica Crowley and Rita effing Cosby. And hereupon I did my impression of Rita Cosby's gravel goggling voice. Zucker had no answer to that or anything else. Just as Phil Griffin had no answer and Kappas and everybody else I tried, and I even tried Brian Williams. They had no answers to my inescapable argument, and I had no power to act without them. I saw the future. The next great star of cable news, millions of dollars in profits for NBC, and another foothold on the sheer cliff of corporate media's built-in conservatism, a little breathing room for me. I told everybody who would stop long enough to listen, even the future star herself, And incredibly, I had to talk her out of her own doubts, too. And we went on like this virtually from the day I first talked to the object of my programming desire in 2007 until the blistering afternoon in July of 2008, when Phil Griffin finally got the promotion to be president of MSNBC. And he phoned me and he said, buddy, we can now do what we've been planning. And I had to stop myself from saying, who's this we, Lone Ranger? The entire edifice of MSNBC and NBC News above me was not only adamantine against the Rachel Maddow show, but it refused to even let her guest host my show. It was this way for nearly a year, without one crack in solidarity and without one answer. I even had to convince Rachel herself, although in retrospect, she seems to have been mixing a kind of legitimate future shock fear with some very convincing Richard III refusing the crown jazz. I do not think she was being insincere when she said success might destroy her. I do not think she was making it up when she said, but Keith, you have to remember a couple of years ago, I was dressed up as a dancing cell phone outside a cell phone store in Massachusetts. I don't think I'd F it up, but what if it Fs me up? The ice finally broke not long after I had a nightmare. It was so terrifying and realistic and unfortunately so plausible that my then live-in girlfriend, Katie Turr, actually had to shake me awake. I was yelling, apparently, while asleep and, and not because I was being chased by monsters or by courses that I'd entirely forgotten from my senior year in college or both. In this nightmare... John Klein, the president of CNN, who had wanted to pirate me away before he was overruled by his boss, Jim Walton, had fired the person he had to take instead of me, Campbell Brown, the NBC talent he'd settled on. And the reason this was so terrifying was that in real life, it was likely, if not necessarily imminent. Campbell was a chain smoking nitwit with what she only thought was a hidden conservative agenda. We had co-anchored two days of the Weekend Today show, and they had to open up the emergency exit to the street so she could light up a heater, not just during commercial breaks, but even during two-minute-long correspondent reports. She just kept smoking and smoking and smoking and smoking, and I was a smoker and I was repulsed. In real life, CNN was going to replace Campbell Brown soon or late. The 8 p.m. CNN hosts had been in order Connie Chung, Paula Zahn and Campbell Brown, and in my nightmare, the next host would also be a woman, only this time it would be somebody who was going to kick my ass. Rachel Maddow. Let me guess why you're here again, buddy, Phil Griffin said the next afternoon in his office. It was now the middle of the winter of 07-08. We've been all through this. 
Well, what we've been through was various iterations of the supersized countdown idea finally dropped by Zucker in favor of a novel concept that he and Phil Griffin had dreamed up, an LGBTQ host at 9 o'clock. But of course, not the LGBTQ host that I had suggested, but rather their brilliant idea for a host for the 9 p.m. show on MSNBC following mine, Rosie O'Donnell. In November 2007, Phil Griffin told me he thought they were close to signing Rosie O'Donnell, and as usual, he had leaked it to the New York Times just so everybody would know how damned earnest he was. But then Rosie announced she only wanted to do a show three days a week and none of them in a row. The prospect of Monday, Rosie. Tuesday, Bupkus. Wednesday, Rosie. Thursday, Bupkus. Friday, Rosie. Proved too much even for Phil's ability to convince himself of almost anything. You got anything new I can shoot down or can we just talk about the Mets? I told him about my Rachel Maddow, John Klein nightmare. CNN, they don't even know who Rachel Maddow is. Why would they hire her? Why would they put her on at eight against you? Why would you put a liberal show on against another liberal show? The nonsense of his rhetorical question actually seemed to briefly register with him. Then it died quickly somewhere in some brain cells burned out by all the stuff he'd smoked when we'd worked together at CNN in the early 80s. Nah. I mumbled, I work for idiots, but it was not loud enough for him to hear. Phil, what if they do it just to, you know, take away some of our audience. What if they do it just to make sure we don't give her our nine o'clock show? What if they, you know, gave her a show and then promoted it with, what are they called? Advertisements? And maybe even, you know, commercials? Or what if she's really effing good like she is every effing time we effing put her on the show with me? Can't we at least try her as my fill-in host? Can't we at least get her a deal to keep her from leaving just as a contributor? What would it cost you, 40 grand, 50 grand? To my shock, Phil Griffin agreed to give Rachel Maddow a contributor's contract for 40 or 50 grand. Yeah, well, let's do that, buddy. Will that show it shut you up for a while? I shook his hand. No, of course not, I said. And of course, he was lying. Phil never signed Rachel to a contributor's contract, which is how, a few weeks later, we almost lost her to CNN for 250 freaking dollars. And I had to pay her $437 in cash to keep her from going to CNN. But I've already told you that story. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown has come to you from the world headquarters of the Alderman Broadcasting Empire in New York. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on the guitars, bass, and drums, and Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards, and it was produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olderman theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my dear friend John Dean, and everything else was pretty much my fault. That's Countdown for this, the 280th day until the 2024 U.S. presidential election and the 1,121st day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment, the Insurrection Act, the justice system, and the mental health system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bolton's as the news warrants, and if my voice holds out. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. We have Ted Nugent. We have influencers. Right? We have all these people. John Voight. John Voight. Still alive? John Voight.